Okay, so hi, my name is Sebastian Budden. I'm a founding member of Historical Materialism Journal and the book series and the conferences, some of which you would already be familiar with. So I want to just to pitch to you the idea of you uh, subscribing to the journal, firstly. The journal comes out four times a year, published by Brill, over a thousand pages of uh, extremely important and stimulating uh, Marxist theory and Marxist history. Um, we have a discount at the moment for individual subscribers around the time of the, the London conference, and we very strongly uh, both request and uh, demand that you subscribe to the journal, that you uh, get other people to subscribe to the journal, and of course that you get uh, your institution, if you're part of a university or other institution, to subscribe to the journal. We need more subscribers for this project to be able to expand and continue. The second thing I really wanted to push was the book series. Uh, the book series you will also probably be familiar with. It's published by Real Academic Press, and then the volumes come out 12 months later with Haymarket Books in Chicago, paperbacks. Um, we have more than 200 volumes published now of translations of original work, of document collections, of uh, translations from uh, Marxist theory from across the world, from Japan to uh, China, to um, India, to Latin America, very important Latin American list shaping up in the book series, and so on. Um, it's a really crucial intervention in Marxist uh, literature and uh, in making Marxist theory available um, that really hasn't existed on this scale since the 1970s. So we'd like you to look at the book series, buy individual volumes, perhaps take up the offer of the book club that Haymarket is, uh, is, is uh, promoting. And also, of course, if, you get, if you're part of an institution, to get your institution to buy as many volumes as possible. Uh, those are the two key elements of our activity, aside from the conference, the journal and the book series. And we think that it would be uh, well, we think it's essential, basically, for us, for our existence, for us to be able to continue to thrive, for those to expand. So please, subscribe to the journal, buy the books and the book series, publicize both around you, and help us build the historical materials and projects. Hello and welcome to this historical materialism uh, panel on Marxism identity historical life. We have three speakers um, <clears throat> who are going to speak for around 15 to 20 minutes. While they're speaking and, and indeed afterwards, please put your questions into the chat box and we will uh, endeavour to put those questions to the speakers and, and have, hopefully have a, a good debate afterwards. So uh, the first speaker is Jason Reed who teaches philosophy at the University of Southern Maine. And the title of his paper is Other Scenes, Balabar and Tossel on Class Struggle and the Struggle Over Identity. Jason, over to you. Thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers and co-panelists. Okay. One of the pressing issues of recent years has been the relationship between class struggle or the struggle against capitalism more broadly and the struggle over identity or forms of oppression based on identity. While this relationship has taken on ridiculous and almost charactered forms in the quasi public sphere in the US becoming the split between Bernie bros and the supposed identity politics of the Democratic Party or between the dirtbag left and the woke left, it raises serious issues about the relationship between the state as a manager of ethnic and racial identities and the economy as the hidden abode of exploitation. What I propose here is less an entry into the fray of current debates between identity politics and class struggle, but to look at the way in which two Marxist philosophers, Etienne Balibar and André Tossel, tried to think both the interrelation and irreducibility of identity struggle and class struggle. Balibar and Tossel do so by drawing from the philosophical resources of both Marx and Spinoza, but in different ways. For Balibar is a way of thinking of the other scene of economic struggle, the imaginary constitution of national identities that all economic struggles necessarily pass through. There is no class struggle that does not pass through the struggle of identities, just as there's no struggle over identities that does not pass through economic relations. In a different manner, Tossel focuses less on the relation between imaginary and the real, taken as a state and the economy, than on the relation between what could be considered generic struggles over the very conditions of subjectivity and conflicts over the nature of identity. The two struggles cannot be separated. I argue that read together, Balibar and Tossel's political anthropologies offer a way to not only theorize the intersection 
of class conflict and identity conflict, but a way to think the relation between the state and the economy. So for a small part on Balibar, in some sense, Etienne Balibar's philosophical work from the earliest essays on reproduction to the latest writings on universalism are permeated with the questions of what could be called a political anthropology, an examine of the way of the intersection of identity, subjectivity, and politics. This dense intersection of different problems is carried through in political interventions on democracy and citizenship, as well as philosophical investigations of Hegel, Spinoza, and Marx. However, for our purposes here, it's possible to pull on one consistent thread of this political anthropology, and that has to do with the idea of politics and economics as constituting two different scenes. As Balibar wrote, writes, and here's a long quote, I even think we can describe what such a schema would ideally consist of. It would not be the sum of a base and superstructure working like complement or supplement of historicity, but rather the combination of two bases of explanation or two determinations, both incompatible and indissociable, the mode of subjection and the mode of production, or more generally, the ideological mode and the generalized economic mode. Both are material, although in the opposite sense. To name these different senses of the materiality of subjection and production, the traditional terms imaginary and reality suggest themselves. One can adopt them provided that one can keep in mind that in any historical conjuncture, the effects of the imaginary can only appear through and by means of the real and the effects of the real through and by means of the imaginary. In other words, the structural law of the causality of history is the detour through which and by means of the other scene, let us say in parroting Marx, the economy has no more history of its own than does ideology, since each has a history only through the other that is the efficient cause of its own effects." End quote. As much as Balibar's schema draws its topography from Marx's figure based in superstructure, just as importantly, the work of Althusser to think the superstructure as simultaneously an effect and condition of the base, the conditions of its necessity or its necessary production, it's possible to draw a second philosophical precursor to the schema, and that is Spinoza. Balibar's schema is also drawn from the two foundations of the city that Spinoza gives in the ethics. Spinoza gives us two different demonstrations that probably in 37 of part four of the ethics, two reasons to why people come together to form cities. The first proceeds from reason, from the idea that nothing is more useful to man than man, than we are the source of our common strength and power. It is us rational to unite, combining our different forces into a common body and common striving. The second passes through the affects and the imagination from the fact that everyone strives that others should love what they love. Two different foundations to political life, one rational, the other effective. These two different demonstrations do not so much define two ways of forming the city, two ways of forming a polity, but as human beings are necessarily affective and rational, they constitute two different causalities at, the, at work in every society. As Balibar puts it, sociability is the unity of a real agreement and imaginary ambivalence, both of which have real effects. Or another way to understand the same thing, every existing social form, every nation is at once a real agreement and that is necessarily defined on some level by relations of cooperation and dependence, but is also in the same time a relation of imaginary identification. It is tempting to define these two aspects, real agreement and imaginary identification, with economics and politics, the economy would be the scene of real agreement where humanity lives out the actual relations of material dependence, while politics would be the site of imaginary identifications, the imaginary communities of nation and citizen. However, such a quick one-for-one -one identification might reveal more about the limitations of Marx and Spinoza as Balibar writes, quote, it would be easy to conclude that Marx is basically unaware of the other scene of politics, the scene of communitarian affiliation and therefore unaware of the symbolic violence as well. Although he names it or has bequeathed us one, with, one, with the word ideology, one of the aptest names for it. And to conclude that Spinoza for his part basically ignores the irreducible level of economic antagonism, doubtless because at the economic level or cannot can perhaps be conceived of as a productive force, Spinoza is basically an optimist and a utilitarian, end quote. From this perspective, it is possible to argue that at least in this case, Marxist Spinozism would be a matter of reading the strengths of Marx into Spinoza and vice versa, using the other philosopher to balance the limitations. 
In this case, it's a matter of grasping that the, uh, the economy, the relations of production, are always at once a real agreement constituted by relations of cooperation, dependency, and imaginary identification, which is to say economic relations have their own imaginary aspect. Most notably, and to give it a contemporary spin, we could point out how difficult it is to separate economic activity from productivist imaginations that differentiate between real and so-called fake workers, that such imaginations are not separated from divisions of race and gender, from a tendency to imagine the working class as white and male would only further illustrate this point. At the same time, we could argue that politics too is defined by real agreement and imaginary identification. In some sense, this has been Balibar's focus in recent years as he increasingly tries to differentiate, differentiate the citizen as a figure of liberation and equilibrity from the nation as the latter is defined by the imaginary communities of birth and belonging. What does this mean with respect to the other scene in the passage cited above? On the one hand, we could say that economic conditions only have effects when they pass through imaginary identifications, when they become not just structures, but ways of living and thinking as well as ways of being perceived and vice versa. We could say that conflicts of identity and belonging only have effects, only become actualized when they determine and shape not just the conflict of our identities, but become inscribed in social relations. To say only, however, is a bit deceptive since this is always already taking place as economic relations are shaping relations of identification and difference and hierarchies of race and ethnicity and gender always having effects on the distribution of hierarchies within the relations of production. The dialectic of the other scene is then an attempt to grasp this process without falling into the all too persistent imagination that there exists an economic relation of exploitation or class struggle that is independent of race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality, or that their identities are conflict over identities that do not intersect with economic relations. Second part, Tosell's conflict. Although less well-known in the Anglo-American world because of the paucity of translations, Andre Tosell is perhaps one of Balibar's most important interlocutors. Tosell's work both parallels Balibar, work in terms of figures, the importance of Marx and Spinoza, as well as problems, the question of democracy, citizenship, and religious conflict, while also deviating in some regards, most notably in the importance uh, the former attaches to Gramsci. Uh, a full account of both the points of similarity and opposition is beyond the confines of this paper, what I want to focus here on the way in which Tosell too offers a kind of brief figure for thinking the relationship or schema for thinking the relationship between class and identity conflict. In a small book uh, that could be translated as Essays for a Culture of the Future, Tosell gives a schema of two basic types of conflicts defining contemporary politics. The first, what he refers to as social conflicts, deal with the roots of human existence, sees in terms of its three dimensions, life, work, and speech. Because, quote, life, work, and speech intersected from the basis of human subjectivity as a power to exist in all of its dimensions, end quote. In contrast to these conflicts over the basic aspects of subjectivity, Tosell argues that there are conflicts over identity. Identity refers not to the basic powers to exist, life, labor, and speech as activities, but the specifically constituted empirical self as a particular manner of living and speaking, one that can only make sense against different ways of living and different ways of speaking. As Tosell argues, quote, each subject is an empirical self that certainly can dispense with its capacity to live, work, and speak, but is necessarily marked and identified by a range of differences given by couples or elements of opposition, end quote. Two conflicts are defined less by the other scenes or by a relation of displacement by a constant slippage framed by the fact that each conflict already in some sense contains the other. The difference is primarily one of emphasis. As Tosell argues, Quote, a social conflict always contains a moment of identity, and firstly, a conflict over identity always contains a moment of social conflict, end quote. As Tell asserts in a passage that comes close to Balibar's assertion of the unavoidability of the real and imaginary, writing the following, quote, the, the disjointed unity of subjectivity and identity is a structural condition of humanity. It is a tension of two moments that of generic equivalence, which makes each and every one share the same power to exist as a human being, living, working, speaking, and that of the differential play of identities of the difference which characterizes each specific human which qualified belonging, end quote. Tosell, like Balibar, gets his bearings from Spinoza on this point, but it's less a matter of the anthropological focus on human beings as both rational and effective than the more general ontological point that human beings, like everything else, are both causes 
striving with their basic capacities, working, speaking, and so on, situated within specific ways of living that define our cultural life. Humans are both causes and effects, subjectivity and identity. As Toso goes on to argue, and this would perhaps be the strongest point of difference with Balibar, the two conflicts are situated differently with respect to the imaginary and symbolic. That ideology would involve the imaginaries uh, is actually one of the points of overlap between Balibar and Tosell, but symbolic demands more clarification. Tosell considers the symbolic in a broad sense, not just Ode to Lacan or any other one figure, to be one of the fundamental discoveries of the intersection of psychoanalysis, anthropology, and social thought. The symbolic is structured by the fundamental alterity that defines human existence, that we are born into a world not of our own making and must, if we're going to live in it, must necessarily be related for others for this to happen. The symbolic is then the third that structures every social relation. The presence of the past or the weight of tradition in the symbolic is why Tosell primarily identifies it with religion. Religion has been the primary form of the symbolic in human history, but capitalism fundamentally disrupts this foundation of social life. Its disruption takes two forms. First, there's the famous all that solid melts into air of the manifesto, the dissolution of traditions and norms into the icy waters of calculation. However, but no less important is the way in which capital becomes its own religion of daily life, imposing the wage and commodity form as a symbolic coordinates of our existence. Capital remains a pseudo third, limited because of its abstraction and difference to the particular particularity of social relations as a social relation between people takes the form of relation between things. The most important impact of this is that it is symbolic without unity, without made up entirely of individual egos of desires confronting an impersonal order. Capital is a fundamental transformation of the symbolic, which fundamentally alters its relation to the imaginary, to the conflict over identities. As Tussell argues, the global victory of the market of the universal, of the commodity and wage labor has not only dispensed with the conflicts over identity, has not dispensed with conflicts over identity as its, as its accolades would claim, but it has exasperated them. It is a false unity, an empty universe whose very terms of order, namely wages and commodities, can only constitute hierarchies and conflict. Tosell's understanding of capital as a transformation of the symbolic cuts two ways. First, it introduces a new symbolic found less on common traditions and practices than on common standards in terms of the wage and the commodity form. And second, is also a fundamentally changes the opposition of the two scenes from imagination and real to imagination and symbolic, stressing that capital's affects the representation of our existence as much as its material conditions. To sum up how these two dimensions, imaginary and real, intersect with social conflicts and conflicts of identity in the current era defined less by religion than by capital and state, social conflicts are positioned against the current symbolic of capital, which is one of isolated and separate individuals that live, work, and speak only in their isolation or separation. Identity conflicts are situated against the imaginary which passes off a particular portion of humanity as synonymous with the entirety of humanity against the imperialism of the universal. The necessary and pure logic of these two conflicts that we are always dealing with both the social conflict and conflict over identity is also then confrontation with the constitutive aspects of human thought in terms of both the symbolic and imaginary. As with Balibar's other scene, Tosell's imaginary and symbolic can be understood to be not just an attempt to frame the anthropological conflict between universal particular reason and affect, but does so in a way that both terms must be thought of in terms of their institutionalization and the defining institutions of modern existence, capital which functions as the basics of the symbolic and the state as the place of imaginary conflicts. Conclusion. And I should say this is all very provisional to begin to work out these two different logics here. Uh, Ballybard and Tosell's schemas of conflict overlap in several fundamental ways. Frame the imaginary of identity against its other understood as the economy or the symbolic. In each case, the division between two aspects, imaginary and symbolic, political and economic, is subject to both division and unity. But Ballybar and Tosell give different formulations for each. The differences which I've alluded to here are an important point to consider, but just as important is the demand for a new logic and grammar of struggle, one framed less in terms of the opposition of base and superstructure, economy and identity, and their mutual implication in the rational, affective, and, and imag symbolic and imaginary aspects of human life. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, 
and now we are going to uh, Tom Bunyard, who uh, is at the University of Brighton, where he teaches in the Humanities Department. And his paper is on Guy Debord and Gillian Rose on historical life. Tom. Thank you. Um, it's going to be an awful lot more Debord than there is Gillian Rose, I'm afraid. So, so, so it's, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see how we get on. Um, let me see if I can show my screen. Right. So, um, Debord's 1967 book, The Society of the Spectacle, was very often cast as a prescient account of modern society's ills. Such claims are common in the popular press. It's easy to find examples of journalists claiming that Debord's ideas describe the way we live now, that modern life proves Debord's point 10,000 times over, or declaring that never before has Debord's work seemed quite as relevant as it does now. Within the realms of theory and philosophy, other writers have made similar claims. George O'Gambon, for example, who has the rare honour of being one of the only modern intellectuals that Debord didn't despise, uh, has stated that Debord possessed prophetic clairvoyance because the contemporary phase of capitalism is without doubt the society of the spectacle, and, and you've got a few others here on, on the slide. Very often, claims such as these, particularly those made by journalists, rely upon flawed understandings of what Debord's theory is really about. But even if that were not the case, the very notion of using Debord's 1967 work to explain the present moment is perhaps problematic from the very outset, uh, at least in, in Debord's own view. Uh, and this point is put particularly starkly in his 1978 film, In Gira Mimis Nocte at Consuming My Igni. How do I move my... Go to the next slide. Right, so this is a long quotation, but it's worth looking at in full, I think. He says, uh, the petty people of the present age seem to believe that I've approached things by way of theory, that I'm a builder of theory, a sort of sagely architecture, which they imagine they need only to move into as soon as they know its address, and which 10 years later, they might even modify a little by shuffling a few sheets of paper so as to achieve the definitive perfection of the theory that will effectuate their salvation. But theories are only made to die in the war of time. Like military units, they must be sent into battle at the right moment, and whatever their merits or insufficiencies, we can only use those that are available at the time that they're needed. They have to be replaced because they're continually being worn out by their decisive victories even more than by their partial defeats. Moreover, no living era was ever engendered by a theory. They began with a game or a conflict or a journey. Now, de Boer liked to state that he was not a philosopher, but rather a strategist. And this is because he saw himself first and foremost as a revolutionary. And revolutionary theory for de Boer is, so, is as specific to the context in which it would intervene as any piece of military strategy. And in this passage, he's indicating that his own theoretical work should be allowed to pass away along with the historical moment to which it sought to give theoretical voice. Any attempt to preserve it and to in inhabit it beyond that moment would be to separate theory from practice and thereby reduce his work, as he once put it, to just another empty formula of sociological political rhetoric. Uh, this is this prediction he makes about his own theory towards the end of the society of the spectacle. So clearly this material invites his own critical supersession and development. But I'd like to suggest that any response to that invitation needs to develop not only a new theoretical account of his own moment, but would also need to reformulate some of de Boer's own views about time. And as I'll try to show, de Boer's theoretical claims rely upon a very set, set of very ambitious claims about the nature of human historical existence. And there's a degree of tension, I shall argue, between de Boer's attempts to articulate the revolutionary concerns of a moment and these broad claims about the nature of history per se. I shall try to suggest that this tension can be found in de Boer's 1967 theory of spectacle, and that it may also inform the difference between that work and his later writings. And having made these claims, I shall argue that de Boer's later work does indeed seem prescient today, not least because of the importance it attributes to history. But I shall also propose that if one did want to pursue this material's relevance, that notion of history might need to be altered a little bit. And in the time, if I've got time, uh, I'll say a little bit about how that could be addressed by drawing an element to Gillian and Rose's reading of Hegel, but I'm rather hoping I'd run out of time because I haven't really had time to flesh it out. Uh, right, first, I need to demonstrate the importance of de Boer's ideas about time. And the first point that I need to make in that respect is that his theory is not reducible to an account of capitalist mass media, as often seems to be assumed. Uh, his book, The 1967 Society of the Spectacle, is, tends to be kind of referred to rather more than it's actually read. And the errors of such a reading become, of a media focused reading, become glaringly apparent when one actually looks at the text. Uh, at the very outset, he says, 
Uh, the spectacle cannot be understood either as a deliberate distortion of the visual world or as a product of the technology of the mass dissemination of images. Admittedly, he refers to news or propaganda, advertising or the actual consumption of entertainment as particular forms of spectacle. But only a few pages later, he states that the mass media is only the spectacle's most stultifyingly superficial manifestation. And if these media phenomena are only superficial manifestations of a deeper problem, um, what then is the problem from which they arise? And we can take a step towards answering that question by looking at the following lines from a letter of 1973. He says, behind the phenomenal appearances of the spectacle, for example, television, advertising, the discourse of the state, of the state that is to say particularly mendacious forms, one can find the general reality of the spectacle itself as a moment in the capitalist mode of production. As is now, I think, increasingly acknowledged, the Bull's theory is really an account of a society that's been characterized by fetishism and alienation. It's an account of a society in which the actions and interactions of human agents, and indeed their desires, aspirations, and identities, have become shaped and structured by the dictates of that same economic system. This is a society of spectacle because it renders human subjects passive observers, as it were, of a world shaped by their own alienated objective activity. A world in which they act and interact in response to the options and, uh, and incentives that are presented to them, but which they do not fully control. Uh, and that's probably quite familiar, I think, to some people who are kind of in, in, in engaged in kind of ways people talk about the boy nowadays. Um, but I th the point that I kind of want to emphasize is that all of these ideas rest upon a set of ideas about time and history. And in that same letter from 1973, he writes that the theory of spectacle can only be justified by reference to these three degrees. Simple technical ideological appearances, the reality of the social organization of appearances, and historical reality. Now, I, I tend to kind of think about this as the sort of levels of the theory, uh, the kind of the aspects of, of modern society he's trying to get hold of. Uh, the first corresponds to the media phenomena with which his theory is most commonly associated. The second concerns the social organization of commodity relations, which tends to get picked up in, in the better work on his stuff. But the third, I think, is more, more fundamental uh, because it concerns what is so wrong with spectacular society and what should replace that society. It corresponds to the basic premise and ambitions of Debord's book, which is that modern society has become separated from its own history, or rather from its ability to shape its own lived time, and that the revolutionary struggles of Debord's own day could recover this alienated historical agency. For example, uh, he says, uh, historical time, in a letter of 1969, sorry, uh, Debord says that historical time is both the milieu and goal of the proletarian revolution. The goal of revolution for Debor is to create a social condition that would allow human agents to take direct self-determinate control over their own collective lived time. And this is necessary, he thinks, because we are at present separated from our ability to govern our own lived time. Spectacular society is said to be characterized by a deficiency of general historical life, a condition of historical paralysis, an abandonment of any history founded in historical time, and a false consciousness of time. So what about time? Looks got two entire chapters about time. Uh, and, and talks about history all the way through, but what does he actually mean by history? Um, I think history for De Boer is not just a collection of information about the past or the discipline of studying the past, but rather something that is to be made. Uh, history, in other words, is as much about the construction of the future as it is about reflection on the past. So when he says uh, modern society is a historical society in which history is not yet lived, uh, he means that this society exists in a historical time that we're not in charge of that history. We are mere spectators of the way of life in which we participate, but which we do not fully control. Uh, hence is the term of the Communist Manifesto. History itself is the spectre haunting modern society. Now these ideas rest upon a conception of temporality that was shaped by a combination of French Hegelianism, existentialism, and ideas drawn from the young Marx. Uh, I haven't got time to go through that, but I think you can kind of see how it's playing out uh, in this quotation, which, which a quotation from De Boer, which is itself quoting from um, Hegel's Phenomenology. Uh, it says, uh, man, that negative being, a negative being who is to the extent he abolishes being, uh, is one with time. So the basic idea is that we're historical creatures insofar as we shape ourselves and shape our world through the actions and experiences that we undergo in time. And De Boer stresses that the way in which this takes place and the way in which we understand our temporal condition is always shaped by the social formations that we inhabit. He says the temporalization of man is affected through the mediation of a society. It seems that for De Boer, temporality is inextricably interwoven with sociality, or rather with the operation of social power, 
i.e. the capacities produced by and available to the inhabitants of a given social formation. And it also seems that for De Boer, all social power is ultimately the power to shape history, for it is at root the power to shape what happens in time and to shape how events, actions and possibilities are conducted and understood. Hence his remark that to reflect on history is inseparably to reflect on power. And, sure, uh, and this then means that different social formations must engender differing understandings of and relations to the collective historical agency of their inhabitants. Uh, and sure enough, in the Society of the Spectacle, which contains two chapters on time, we're presented with a narrative that traces the development of different conceptions of time through a series of different social formations. The Bush basic premise here is that throughout the course of human history, humanity's power to shape its own world has grown in tandem with that power's separation from its producers. Uh, he, his own present is thereby cast as a kind of dialectical crux at which humanity's power to shape its own history is greater than ever before, but at which that power is also further removed from its producers than ever before. And this situation is, it said, is cast as being having been brought to a head by modern capitalism. But even so, the problem that this concept of spectacle articulates seems to be much broader and older. And as I understand it, I, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but the way I understand it, the basic problem of spectacle is the separation of... of uh, the basic problem of spectacle is the separation of historically formative power from the direct conscious control of its producers and its fetishistic localization in seemingly independent bodies. And this explains why De Boer in this situation has used the term spectacle and spectacular to refer to phenomena that are not easily reducible to the commodity and its derivatives, such as religion, hierarchy, uh, political leadership, dogma, they're all viewed as instances of spectacle, because in all such instances, social agents become subordinate to concentrated bodies of their own collective power. Um, and he sees this, um, here we are, yeah. Uh, he sees this um, problem as having been present in social formations throughout the past uh, and even traces it back to antiquity. So all separated powers have been spectacular. At the root of the spectacle lies the oldest of all social specializations, the specialization of power uh, and power draped itself in the outward garb of a mythical order from the very beginning. And there's uh, stuff in his uh, letters where he's kind of tracing it all the way back to, to the Greeks and things like this. Um, so the modern revolution was framed as a kind of end of prehistory, which is a, 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 a line that he's borrowing from Marx quite self-consciously, uh, as a point at which history could at long last finally become a collective self-determined construction. Uh, and this bears relation to how he's thinking about the proletariat and kind of modern struggle. Uh, spectacular society leads the revolutionary uh, pro uh, project to become visibly what it always was essentially, it's revealing something that has always been there. Uh, and, and in the demand to live the historical time that it creates, the proletariat finds a simple, unforgettable core of its revolutionary project. Right? So, so it's something that's, that's, that's always been there. So we have a sense in which the contextual demands of the Boer's revolutionary moment are thus cast in overtly Hegelian fashion as the clarification of long-standing demands and struggles that have been here throughout the past. Uh, and this is presented as a... Uh, yeah, this is, presented, this is presented as a broadly Lukashian condition of subject-object unity, as a condition in which human subjects might finally take conscious control of their own objective social existence. So uh, in, in, in history and class consciousness, which has a huge impact on De Boer, uh, uh, Lukash says the proletariat must become the identical subject-object of history. Uh, similarly, uh, De Boer is saying much the same kind of thing in this side of the spectacle. The subject of history can only be the self-production of living, of the living, the living becoming master and possessor of this world, that is of history, and coming to exist as conscious of his own activity. The subject would have no goal other than the effects it works upon it itself. Um, now, the point that I want to stress is this conception of the stakes of revolution is historically situated. Um, and the theoretical perspective is clearly held to be rendered possible by the society of the Boer's own day. It's only possible, he thinks, for this to be um, seen now because of the way the world is set up. But it also mounts the philosophical claim about the very nature of historical time. Uh, and in other words, and despite his emphasis on contextuality, fluidity, movement in history, his basic position comes close to echoing the popular interpretation of Hegel's supposed end of history. The identification of the moment of revolution with a particular historical conjuncture might offer a means of interpreting the changing perspective set out in De Boer's later work. Uh, famously, De Boer in the situation saw the events of May 1968 as a confirmation of their claims. Um, but nonetheless, the fact remains that the revolution that De Boer's theory purported to herald never actually came. 
And because the moment of revolution was located at a particular point, its retreat into the past fostered a sense of lost possibility. And this seems to inform some of the differences between Debord's broader utopian claims in the 1960s and his later increasingly pessimistic views. Uh, for example, in 1971, when describing a society, was describing society that is not yet self-determined, but instead ever more determined by a part of itself, he rejects the idea that the advent of revolution is certain. In 79, having become fascinated by the Italian Annie di Piombo, uh, he wrote uh, of the difficulty and immensity of the task of the revolution. By the 1980s, things are getting a bit more bleak. Uh, and in his comments on the society perspective of 1988, he speaks of the falsification of the entire globe. The modern spectacle, he claims, had spread itself to the point where it now permeates all reality and no longer confronts the latter as something alien. Now, the Boer's comments on the society of the spectacle deserve to be revisited today. Um, when it first appeared, its account of generalized confusion, manipulation, distraction, and demagoguery uh, was viewed as excessively pessimistic and even paranoid. Today, however, the book's analysis seems strikingly pressing. It kind of seems on the money when you read it now. It was kind of freaky at the time. Everyone kind of hated it because this guy's uh, far too paranoid. But you read it now, it's like, well, yeah, this is, this is the world. Um, so I, I, I think it's kind of worth revisiting it and having another look at it. Um, perhaps the most interesting element of the book is that it describes many of the features of our current context as stemming from a general loss of history, the same kind of loss of history that I tried to outline earlier on. Uh, the book offers a means of understanding modern society as a totality by viewing its pathologies as stemming from this generalized loss of historical orientation and direction. Um, so I, I'm, I'm kind of attracted to that. I think, I think that's, that's kind of interesting and worth pursuing. Um, but as we saw earlier, we should be wary of not just of adopting and inhabiting De Boer's theory, because he's saying don't do it. Um, but in addition, we might also be somewhat cautious of some aspects of his understanding of history. And if it is indeed the case that works such as the comments can be recognized as affording some insight into our present, then they'd need to be reformulated in a way that also reframes some of the ideas about history that inform them. Now, to give the ball his due, um, there's a good deal of material in his work that would, in fact, accord with that suggestion, and which should provide plenty of kind of kit uh, to enable you to do that. Um, much of it is to do with his ideas about strategy. He never set out his ideas about strategy um, in completely or in detail. Uh, he was totally opposed to the idea of doing so. Um, but one can infer quite a lot from his, from his notes, his letters, and his other writings. Um, much of that material indicates that his idiosyncratic identification of strategy and dialectics and dialectics with the process of history points towards a theory of the corrigibility uh, of practical action and thought in, in time. And I, I think you could do it just by looking at Debord, I think, really, and kind of pulling some of that stuff out of his work. That might give you um, plenty of stuff to perhaps kind of play with. Um, but what I wanted to suggest, um, if there's any kind of time left, really, would be to take a slightly different tack and suggest that another, uh, perhaps supplemental approach could be to try to reframe some of Du Bois' ideas by drawing on those of Gillian Rose. Um, so I've got a tiny little bit of time left, I think. I'll have a go at doing this. So Rose's most celebrated book is her second work, Hegel Contra Sociology. Its primary concern is with the identification of arbitrary, unjustified authority. And the forms of authority that she focuses on tend to stem from the prioritization of either the individual or the social. The flawed nature of modern society, in her view, posits agents as abstractly free, equal individuals, but which also form coerce of unequal social institutions. And this gives rise to two opposing types of normative authority, both of which can be hypostatized in a host of different ways. Faith versus reason, subjective freedom versus structural determinism, and so on, but which she gathers together under the rubrics of the soul and the city. And she also uses religion and the state. Both are crucial aspects of social life, but when, one, but when privileged over the opposite and left unquestioned, each can serve as sources of imposed authority. Rose theorizes this by turning to Hegel's own diagnosis of disparities between forms of universality and particularity, and she takes from this the task of pursuing what she calls an absolute ethical life, a harmonious common ground in which these two aspects of sociality can be unified. And for Rose, Hegel did not achieve or announce such a unity, but rather diagnose his absence from the modern world. For Rose, it is in the full unswerving identification of the absence of harmony and of the failures and limitations of our attempts to instantiate it that absolute ethical life could be glimpsed. And I think there are many points of connection between Du Bois' claims and Rose's Hegel. Uh, 
Rose's views concerning what she calls the misrecognition of social substance um, echoes, I think, in many respects, some of Dawes' ideas about spectacle. In both cases, the problem is that um, pro the problem that's being identified is the misidentification of collective identity and formative power and the consequent accommodation of dictates derived from that power. And moreover, Rose places particular emphasis on the importance of Marx's conception of commodity fetishism, arguing that this needs to be used as the basis for theorizing capitalist culture. It might be fruitful to look at Deborah's according with that prescription to some degree, albeit whilst noting the degree to which his claims are subject to her critique of Lukács. But the most important issue is the sense in which Rose's Hegel affords a conception of history that's always rooted in the struggles and dilemmas of the present, and a consequent orientation to the future that follows from the failings of both the past and that present moment. So I think one thing perhaps to try to pursue uh, is the sense in which aspects of the Boer's Hegelian work seem, well, sorry, if there are aspects of the Boer's work that seem prescient today, then perhaps one way to do so might be to reformulate some of his claims by drawing on aspects of Rose's work as a way of rethinking some of his ideas about time and history and orientation um, to the future. I shall stop. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, our final speaker, who is a, a late addition to the panel, is Evan Smith, who teaches history at Flinders University, South Australia. He's going to be talking about a very curious journey, anti-statism and the trajectory from the Revolutionary Communist Party to spite. Evan, over to you. Thank you. Uh, just uh, trying to get this all set up properly. And I think, all right, uh, hopefully that's working. Um, okay, so yes, I'm a late addition to uh, this panel and I don't really have slides, I just have this nice little uh, title page. Um, so, Although it remained a, a tiny group during the 1980s, the Revolutionary Communist Party has become infamous for the number of ventures that grew out of the far left group and the prominent role that many of the party's former members occupy in the British media and political landscape nowadays. The RCP uh, formally disbanded in 1996, but became infamous after its journal Living Marxism was sued for libel uh, by ITN regarding claims made about the news company's coverage of aspects of the Balkan Wars. Uh, after losing the case and the winding up of Living Marxism, which had then become LM, uh, the magazine's former editors, alongside other leading RCP members, formed the website Spiked Online. In the last 20 years, Spiked has become an increasingly vocal and visible actor in Britain's culture wars, combining libertarianism and populism with a penchant for contrarianism. A number of its editorial team and contributors have made headway in the mainstream media, such as Frank Faridi, Joanna Williams, Mick Hume, Brendan O'Neill, and Tom Slater. At the same time, former RCP member Claire Fox has become a member uh, uh, of the European Parliament for the Brexit Party and is now a Baroness in the House of Lords. Uh, also a person that was involved in the post-RCP LM network, Manira Mirza, is a chief political advisor for Boris Johnson. A spike appears to have gained access to the corridors of power and scale the heights of the media in Britain uh, at a time when British politics is also left into the right. My paper will briefly discuss how the RCP transformed from a small Trotskyist party in the 1980s to the notorious website that Spike is today, developing uh, this idea of what critics have referred to as the RCP LM Spike network. Although the trajectory from the far left to the right is not an uncommon phenomenon, the shift en masse uh, from the RCP to Spike via living Marxism which kept much of the same leading personnel intact and with few openly breaking with the party slash network is more unique. As Chris Gilligan, a former RCP member has noted, the network seemed to be quite a conscious decision made in the late nineties, citing Dole and Cum Cummings writing for Spiked in 2007. Cummings wrote, I never left the RCP. The organization folded in the mid nineties, but few of us actually recanted, recanted is in quote marks, our ideas. Instead, 
We resolve to support one another more informally as we pursued our political tradition as individuals or launch new projects with more general aims that have also engaged people from different traditions or none. These include spiked in the Institute of Ideas. Over the years, the former RCP members who have made the initial transition from LM into spiked, uh, uh, into LM and spiked have fallen away or become less involved, even though their public criticisms of their former comrades is muted. Uh, looking at the RCP through the lens of its successes, there has been a debate about whether the RCP was ever part of the left. For example, there is a, a view uh, that it was not part of the left uh, at all. Um, so Andy Beckett, writing in The Guardian, wrote uh, last year, despite its name, most of its stances were not communist or revolutionary, but contrarianism. It supported free speech for racists and nuclear power. It attacked environmentalism and the NHS. Its most consistent impulse was to invoke an idealized working class and claim it was actually being harmed by the supposed elites of the liberal left. On the other hand, left historian Lawrence Parker has suggested that the RCP was nothing special. Uh, and similar to other groups on the British left, such as the Leninist faction within the Communist Party of Great Britain. My paper seeks to a path between these two poles. In the 1980s, the RCP still situated itself within the political landscape of the British far left, but its line on a number of issues was very different from those of other groups and often in stark contradiction to them. The approach to the RCP to other left groups was also fairly hostile seeking to build a revolutionary Leninist organization that acted independently to the various left parties that already existed and, but also the wider labor movement. I, I would say that it's only in the 1990s that the RCP starts to dis disassociate itself from organized socialist politics on the whole and promoting the notion that the class struggle was over, instead emphasizing the battle of ideas. Charting the trajectory from the RCP to LM and then to Spiked, it is important to highlight the continuities and discontinuities. There are certain discontinuities and, and contradictions held between the positions held by the RCP in the 1980s and those promoted by Spike today. But there are also some continuities, not only in personnel, but only, also in approach to issues. One of the continuities that can be seen in the politics of the RCP LM spike network is the suspicion of state intervention and an underlying anti statism. In the 1980s, this was a radical left stance that attracted some fellow travelers from anarchists and other left libertarian uh, circles, which I can talk more about in discussion. Uh, in more recent times, uh, Spike's anti-statism has attracted more support from the right, but is also used as a point of distinction with others on the conservative and populist right. An example of this are the discussions about Tory legislation, about, uh, about the protest laws and freedom of speech laws. Uh, this paper will look at three distinct uh, eras of the, of, the, of the Spike's network, the 1980s, the 1990s, and the post-2000s, and examine the continuities and discontinuities in the approach to the state and state intervention. So the 1980s. During the 1980s, the line of the RCP towards the state and state intervention was one of opposition, which was shared more or less in theory by most of the British radical left at the time. In the 1984 edition, uh, edition of the RCP manifesto, Preparing for Power, so you can see a little picture of Preparing for Power there, the party stated the state is the employer's main weapon for enforcing the domination of capital and thus the precondition for the liberation of society is the destruction of the capitalist state. For the RCP, this meant recognising the oppressive nature of the state and overcoming the illusion that certain parts of the bourgeois state could be used to the left's advantage. One of the key components of the RCP's program during this period was anti around anti-racism, primarily via the front group Workers Against Racism. And this is where we can see a kind of uh, a discussion of the state. In 1985, Workers Against Racism published a pamphlet called The Roots of Racism, which argued that the British state was institutionally racist and that various arms of the state, from the police to the home office to the housing department, sustained the racist consensus 
that pervades British society. From this point of view, the RCP argued that state institutions could not be used for anti-racist purposes, with a particular emphasis on opposing state bans on or cooperating with the police against fascists and racists, which this also underpins their opposition to no platforming since the 1980s. Similar to criticism made by Paul Gilroy and the Asian youth movement, the RCP argued that municipal anti-racism was also ineffectual uh, based on moralism and platitudes. Similar arguments were made in regards to women's liberation and women's rights. While acknowledging that women had often benefited from the steady advance of the state intervention in the capitalist economy, with a reform such as child benefits, maternity benefits, sick pay, unemployment benefits, and pensions being made available to women, Kate Marshall wrote in 1982 that in reality, the state cannot rise above the laws of the capitalist system. Marshall's 1987 pamphlet, Moral Panics and Victorian Values, also highlighted how the state and the capitalist market promoted a new morality that targeted women, homosexuality, and sex outside marriage. The purpose of this was, in Marshall's word, the elevation of the family, parental responsibility, and respect for law and order and the authority of the state. In almost all aspects of the RCP's program, state intervention or cooperation with state institutions was seen as problematic as the oppressive and censorious aspects of the state, such as policing, immigration control, or state censorship uh, um, were, uh, you know, always present. Under Thatcher's neoliberal and socially conservative government, opposition to the state was a relatively straightforward position for the radical left. But in the 1990s, as Thatcherism shifted in, uh, over the decade into Blairism and New Labour, the RCP viewed the state as acting in a slightly different way. So in the 1990s, the RCP undergoes significant change. In his account of the life of the RCP, leading uh, former member Michael Fitzpatrick, who was known as Mike Freeman back then, uh, says that during the first half of the 1990s, the RCP argued that the working class had disappeared as a political force and deeming that the Revolutionary Party was redundant, emphasised a shift towards advancing an intellectual rather than a practical alternative. One of the major causes of this was the end of the Cold War. Like the rest of the British left, the collapse of the Eastern Bloc between 1989 and 1991 disorientated the RCP. Writing at the end of 1990, uh, the leader of the RCP, Frank Richards, now we know as uh, Frank Faridi, argued in Living Marxism that the situation both in Britain with the, with the collapse of Thatcherism or the collapse of the Thatcher government and Eastern Europe demonstrated that Labourism and Stalinism had failed. Yet unlike others on the Trotskyist left, which put themselves as forward as a revolutionary alternative, both Richards in an article titled Midnight in the Century claimed that there was no political vehicle left for the working class, implying that the revolutionary communist vanguard that the RCP had promoted during the 1980s was no longer an option. And over the next decade, the RCP invented, reinvented itself. For the R RCP, the class struggle took a back seat to the battle of ideas and living Marxism uh, became uh, uh, became the de facto party. Practical organization was increasingly seen as a dead end and in its place, the RCP argued the political alternative needs to be uh, developed intellectually foremost. The various campaigns like Workers Against Racism, the campaign against militarism and Irish freedom movement were, were slowly kind of like wound up uh, or that the, they had um, a decreasing importance in the RCP. Fewer demonstrations were organized by the RCP and there was more interest in hosting public events to debate ideas, which would then lead into the battle of ideas um, in, the, in the 2000s. Um, part of this shift was a view that the old distinction between right and left had collapsed and there was little difference between the authoritarianism of the Thatcher major governments and that of New Labour, and they're warning about this even before Blair wins power in 1997. Those writing for living Marxism saw the impulse of the nanny state as stretching across the conservative Labour divide and reflecting a new generation of middle-class elites. 
Mick Hume, who is the editor of Living Masterson, wrote in 1994, uh, the way to win support for a law and order crusade today is to repackage it much more as a police campaign against racist attacks, domestic violence, child abuse, and pornography. Uh, for living Marxism, both sides of government were seen as ban happy and as Hume wrote in 1996, attempted to reassert their authority through hyped up crusades against easy targets. Living Marxism ran numerous stories throughout the 1990s of bans or state interventions around a number of social issues. Uh, and some of them, you know, infamous ones you see on the front covers is things such as like obesity, drugs, youth crime, uh, single mothers. The state was still seen as oppressive, and for example, defined by its institutional racism, uh, but the, it was um, it was much more kind of like a free floating in that uh, about its uh, economic uh, imperative. Um, but one of the things I think is, is highlighting is they still believe that the state was like institutionally racist, sexist, homophobic, etc. That and this comes up a lot of time, but also that the argument that the state is institutionally racist was then used as a way of criticizing other forms of activism. In the 1990s, state racism was used as a reason to criticize anti fascist work, such as that being done by the Anti Nazi League, because, it, because in the eyes of the RCP, uh, of the RCP and living Marxism, it focused on the consequences of racism, racial violence and the BNP, and not the cause of racism, government and state agencies. Um, so that, you know, that they still believe in uh, institutional racism and state racism, but the more ambivalent about what is to be done. Um, in the final year of the RCP, uh, Living Marxism produced a new manifesto called The Point is to Change It, uh, emphasising uh, this kind of the, this ideological change uh, and they're more a push that the, the party organisation uh, was to be jettisoned. There was a debate about the use of the RCP as a revolutionary party uh, throughout the mid-1990s uh, and it was finally announced in no March 1998 that living Marxism had dissolved, um, although that we gathered that this happened in either late 1996 or early 1997. The years after the dissolution of the party were dominated by the libel case with uh, ITN, um, which bankrupted the magazine and the uh, former editors and the people in the RCP looked for a new venture. Uh, in 2000, the the magazine finally uh, wound up, and those who had been in leadership positions within the RCP and at the helm of the magazine started the millennium with the new project Spiked Online. This new website operated in a similar manner to Living Marxism, seemingly but seemingly free from the constraint of a party line. Um, although it was surprising or unsurprisingly consistent in its approach to issues such as the absolute defense of free speech, the criticism of government interventions in many areas as overreach of the nanny state, the characterization of progressive politics as moralism and a growing opposition to identity politics. As well as the party faithful from the 1980s, Spiked also featured a new generation of writers, some who have started contributing to LM in its final years, such as Brendan O'Neill, alongside others who were brought on since the magazine folded. Um, some of the anti-statism of the RCP and living masses of years remained in some areas, but disappeared in others. In the early days of Spike, there was still an acknowledgement of, of, of things such as institutional racism, and the website, one in its early days, republished uh, an article Article that Mick Hume had written about the McPherson report in 1999. Um, Hume said, of course there is racism in Britain uh, emanating most powerfully from the police and other state institutions. But comparing this with today, more recently, the writers of Spike have become much more skeptical about the state uh, being institutionally racist. After the Sewell report was published earlier this year, the proposed that the term institutional racism was being liberally used and often without evidence, Brendan O'Neill welcomed this as a sign that the myth of institutional racism was collapsing. A long read by Luke Gittos, 
in August 2020 for the website argued, the fact remains that the persistence of racial prejudice is not the most significant problem facing the police. It is strange that this even is saying that the vast majority of current police officers are not racist. They are civic minded people who deserve our respect. So we can see a stark contrast between the kind of the, the way that the state and state agencies were viewed uh, by the RCP in the 1980s, even in the 1990s, and the way that they are uh, seen nowadays. Um, and the, but the state also comes up in other ways in Spike's output. While much of Spike's output in recent times has chimed with the culture wars being more broadly pursued by the right, the scepticism towards the state reveals the degree of difference between those that spiked and the traditional Tory base. An example of this uh, is that in much of the right-wing press has supported Priti Patel's wide-ranging police, crime sentencing and courts bill, Spike writers have portrayed it as an attack on freedom of assembly and protest. This can also be seen um, with Spike's criticism of the Freedom of Speech uh, Higher Education Bill, um, who they see as, which they see as overreach. Much of, the, of Spike's anti-statism extends from the premise that a certain tranche of elites, often middle class and or, in inverted commas, woke, have captured control of state and industry and seek to clamp down on sections of society. This can be seen in opposition of Spike to what they call censorship via legislation, such as Scotland's recent hate crime bill. It can also be seen in uh, Spike's opposition to lockdown laws and other measures brought in during COVID, which have been portrayed as authoritarian and a threat to freedom. This last point has obviously tapped into a wider anti-lockdown sentiment, which has spread across the globe in the last 18 months. So in conclusion, the trajectory of the RCP to spike over a 30 year period is an interesting story, but also um, an important one as it can help explain the origins of a network that has gained prominence in the British political and media landscape. Although there are many discontinuities to highlight between the RCP in the 1980s and spiked in the present, uh, uh, there are also continuities. Since the days of the, uh, of the Revolutionary Communist Party, there's been an anti-state strain to their politics, opposing state intervention and a state's infringement upon personal freedoms, which still appears in different ways in the politics of Spike at this moment. But while the state was seen by the RCP as institutionally racist, sexist, and homophobic in the 1980s, this does not seem to be the case with Spike's notion of the state. The state for Spike seems to be driven by the authoritarian and amorphous uh, desires of the elites, often characterized as middle class and politically correct. In an era when the right has attempted across the world to capture the language of freedom, the select anti-statism of Spike help shift the Overton window around this discourse. Thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing my screen now. Okay, thank you uh, to our, our three panelists. Um, so uh, we've got some questions coming in on uh, the, the chat box. Please do, please do keep them coming in. Uh, I'll kick off with a, a question. Um, while while others are thinking about adding to the chat box, so I, I wanted to ask Evan, as your historian, uh, I wanted to ask you if if you think the rec the historical record on the left supposed insensitivity uh, to non class identities um, has been an exaggeration, or whether whether actually the historical record there's actually quite a lot of good good practice that has that has been around. Um, and then I suppose to the other to the other panelists and a, a provocation uh, has the left uh, in, has the left's engagement with those uh, other scenes of identities around race, gender, and sexuality has that been one at the cost of uh, a deep and transformative reconstruction of the mode of production as a, as a kind of political objective? <coughs> and, you know how is that kind of feeding into into kind of practical politics sort of being dominated by the right and liberalism. So I'll start with Evan. Yeah, give us a bit of historical context if you, if you could. Yep. So um, that's the left's history and the, and what we would now 
identity politics and and kind of things about anti-racism and the fight for women's rights, women's liberation, gay rights, and various other things like that. It's uh, like, so I focus predominantly on Britain and Australia, um, that it's it's mixed. Um, but we can recognise that, that, that a lot of the left made a lot of important advancements uh, that you can point all the way back to the Communist Party's um, in in the 1920s and 1930s uh, and their kind of agitation against racism, racial discrimination. But that was uh, obviously tied to um, uh, kind of anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism. Um, and that in places like Britain, Australia, and the United States, the communists are at the forefront of kind of like uh, advocating an anti-racist position although that um you know the, the criticism of like that this was tempered uh by stalinism and the popular front etc um and it kind of depends on the you know the political the different various groups like so you know in my work i've looked at like the british communist party and the socialist workers party um and, you know and like who and the, the swp is very important for anti-fascism um in britain in the 1970s um not so good on women's liberation and gay rights uh but then there's other groups like militant or the workers revolutionary party who are much more kind of like um less advanced on those issues um the rcp puts uh, which is you know the focus of my paper puts a real lot of emphasis on anti-racism a lot of emphasis on uh, solidarity with Irish Republicanism. Um, they criticise like the SWP and Anti-Nazi League for being too um, too willing to involve work with the state to kind of like ban uh, the National Front and that kind of stuff, and, and that they kind of like they're not willing to kind of make a revolutionary case for anti-fascism. And this is one of the first criticisms the RCP makes uh, against the kind of the left and kind of is one of the areas to make a distinction between the RCP position and the rest of the left, which they see as kind of conceding to the chauvinism and nationalism that exists in British society and in the British Labour movement. Um, but you know yeah but it you know it's varied and it uh between the parties and obviously over time as a historical thing but yes um the the kind of these ideas of race gender uh sexuality um that kind of thing that the the left do make important interventions but then also uh, as historians we need to recognize uh the limits of this and that can be and i've you know i've argued that needing to understand identity politics nowadays and kind of this the the abandonment of class is a, comes back that we need to understand why identity politics shifted away from the organized left in the first place and, the, and a feeling by many that the organized left were overlooking uh issues of race and gender and sexuality and emphasizing class too much um so yeah that's my Great, thank you. Um, Tom, uh, do you want to jump in here then on this question? I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. Is, is, okay, is it... so my, my, my sort of provocation to, to, to you and, and Jason was, you know, has the left's engagement with these other scenes and, and uh, 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 these other scenes of identities, is the Balabar formulation that Jason referred to, you know, has that been at the cost of a deeper kind of transformative reconstruction of the mode of production, which sort of comes through strongly with De Boer? Yeah, um, yes, I, 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 I think so. Yeah, I, I mean, the, um, I mean, if, if this is about the kind of the the move away from the priority of the kind of the white male worker and the kind of the recognition of other kind of positions and all the rest of it. I mean, yeah, there's a kind of an important move there, but um, the shift away from the focus on class comes with all sorts of kind of obvious problems and you end up with um, perhaps a form of capitalism that can accommodate uh, some of these kind of um, demands for uh, forms of kind of recognition of, of, of different identities. Um, so, 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 so yes, um, and, and 
I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure to add, to add to that really, but yes, I, I think I think it does come with a problem. Yeah. Jason, would you like to jump in? Sure. Yeah. Um, in terms of what you're saying, um, I'm not sure about the cost, but I do think there's an interesting. And this may touch on some of the things that Paniotis is asking about the pedagogic pedagogical aspect as well. Is that I think you could argue that you know, given this idea of sort of looking at the political and the economic as two different scenes and constantly vacillating between one and the other. One of the things interesting is that sometimes conflicts which first appear to be political understood in terms of a politics of civil rights or racial uh, recognition, like say some of the politics around Black Lives Matter in the US, prove among uh, further examination to also have a very interesting economic component to them of the way in which say, for example, the events in Ferguson, Missouri revealed to what extent in some cities in the US, the police primarily operate as a revenue stream for the cities, right? Stopping people and pulling people over and accumulating fines is a way to deal with the pressures on the one hand of a right-wing government, which is pushing against taxation and their shrinking tax base is to sort of almost operate as a kind of extortion. So it exposes a, a, a new interesting economic dimension to a kind of de-industrialized working class where you have uh, uh, people who are in many ways cast out of, uh, of, of industrial jobs, um, you know, scratching to get by the outskirts of society, but also preyed upon by um, police forces as a way of extracting wealth. So I would say that, that you know, to kind of push this, this, what I was saying in this direction, that every time you, you're confronted with a, a purely sort of political conflict around rights and so on, to look for the economic dimension, and I would say the reverse would equally be true, to constantly read these two scenes as a kind of, you know, background and negative against each other in all conflicts, um, to exp and, and in doing so, this is where the pedagogical part in, comes in, expand our understanding of what economic conflict is, not just class conflict in terms of wages and so on, but it also can involve the way in which cities um, are, are, are coming up with ways to extract revenue primarily on the poor, right? When you start pulling people over for busted taillights and other mild you know, traffic infractions, you are primarily raising revenue on the poorest because you've for political reasons are not raising revenue from the wealthiest. So the class conflict also manifests itself in different ways too. Okay, uh, thank you, Jason. Um, I'm gonna come back, to, because you've just been speaking, Jason, I'm gonna come back to those questions that have been posed to you. Um, but I first wanna go to a question from Yagmar, which is to Evan. So can we draw a parallel between the trajectory of RCP and that of Max Eastman et al? Okay, yeah, so, so Eastman uh, goes from uh, radicalism to kind of anti-communism uh, in the 1950s. I think one of the, you know, the, as I mentioned, that the shift from the far left to the right is not uncommon. And we see this with individuals, um, you know, across, you know, across the world. We see examples in America, Britain, Germany, France, wherever. I think the interesting thing about the RCP it's not just a story of disillusionment of the God that failed. It's an organisational or kind of en masse shift. It's not just one person uh, leaving, but it's kind of like a whole bunch of people shifting um, at the same time and also some kind of resembling some kind of organisational uh, coherence around this, around like the, an, a party line without a party existing. Um, you know, similar, the people have made similar uh, arguments about Marxism today as kind of like uh, an organisational shift. And it is very interesting that you can contrast living Marxism and Marxism today as kind of these two kind of like the part, de facto party via journal. Um, but I think that like, you know, Eastman or, you know, various people like that, that, you know, we see this as kind of an individual shift but I think what is different is, and what kind of is so interesting about the 
RCP and a shift into spiked by living Marxism is that it is uh, something that is done en masse and has done something without little, uh, without little criticism of people who have fallen away from the party. So when the RCP splits or, or doesn't split, when it dissolves in 1996, there is, a, is not much public criticism from people who did not join that journey into LM and then into Spiked. And even people who have fallen away from Spiked more recent years who have been comrades since the 1980s, they have been kind of muted in any public criticism uh, of it. So I th I th that's what I think is the difference is the kind of the, the kind of the organizational shift rather than the individual. Thank you, Evan. Okay, so I'm gonna take a question from Yagmar to uh, Comrade Reed. Um, but I think maybe Evan, you might also want to come in on this. Uh, let's see. How would you or the thinkers you have elaborated uh, on interpret Lenin's view of the primacy of politics? I have in mind his work on right of nations for self-determination. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, so, I mean, I do think there's a certain sense in which I think, especially in the case of Balibar, his idea of the other scene is primarily for an intra sort of national context where he's drawing attention to the way in which there is both a conflict between the economic dimension and the sort of uh, uh, imaginary dimension of sort of symbolic belonging in terms of the nation, but then the nation at two, two especially in Balibar's later work, splits into two between the citizen, which is sort of the egalitarian equilibrity aspect of political belonging, not restricted by by notions of birth, tradition, habits, customs, and so on. And then the nation, which is always tied into particular cultural norms and ethnic identity and so forth. Um, and so I think he's primarily thinking that conflict within the nation. Um, Tosell, I think is a different matter. I think for Tosell may have a globalized uh, dimension of conflict uh, internal to his own concept. I think one of the things that Tosell stresses um, is that um, far from sort of eliminating uh, uh, national conflict, the sort of dominance of, you know, call it for lack of a better word, neoliberal or a certain kind of market rationality imposed upon sort of as the relation between nations and so on, um, actually exacerbates conflicts um, because of the way in which it retranslates um, national belonging in terms of sort of failures of competitiveness and so on. Um, so I'm not really, I mean, the Lenin questions, I don't know if I can do justice to that right now, um, uh, but I do think that's where the national question appears. I think for Balibar, it's primarily one in terms of nationalism as a force internal to the nation, um, which is always going to be counter a sort of revolutionary, counter equilibrity to use that term. Um, and Tosell's emphasis on, on the nation as itself kind of a way of regulating and uh, dissipating class conflict in a global scale. So that's response to that. Evan, did you want to come in on the politics? Uh, just very quickly, the RCP um, originally, they're part of a, the right opposition within the SWP in the 1970s, and they, they split to become the Revolutionary Communist Group originally, and then the RCT splits from that. And that is an argument about that they need to inject politics into uh, worker struggle. The, the, the criticism of SWP and the rank and file strategy of the 1970s, as they argued that the SWP are getting involved in the everyday struggles of, of workers, but they're not injecting politics. They're, that there's no kind of political consciousness and the SWP are following rather than leading the workers. And so the RCG, so the right opposition, which becomes the RCG and then the RCT, argue that, you know, that revolutionary politics, you know, based on Leninism, 
um, needs to be uh, inserted into into workers' struggles, and that uh, fighting things like nationalism and chauvinism in in, in the workers in the workers' uh, movement, and then also solidarity with Ireland. So that's so that's the point of the that they argue as they use like Lenin uh, to argue that you know that the vanguard needs to be there uh, to inject politics into the workers str- into worker struggles um, against the kind of economism of the uh, um, the of the SWP at that time okay thanks uh, Evan uh, I think Jason you wanted to put a question to Tom Yes, sorry, I was just trying to type it. So, um, yeah, Tom, I, I really liked your the, the reading you were doing of Debord and especially the way in which you're trying to push beyond the certain reduction to media or images and, and so on to focus on sort of alienation and, and, and activity in history in general. But I guess the thing that I, and when you put, put up that first list of uh, citations from Debord, the thing that struck me is, and this is my question, is like, given that De Boer does a strange move where he sort of uses the image or uses the mediation of images as a kind of figure, but constantly says, it's more than that. It's not just that, like, don't, don't, don't fall for the image. I, I, I wonder how you see the, this, the idea of the image or the visual functioning in De Boer's argument as this kind of mediator almost between like the, 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 the level at which one enters. I'm, I'm thinking of his strategy of writing, like the, the immediate sort of sense you make of it and then the attempt to push beyond that immediate sort of identification of the spectacle with an image. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, I think so. I'll, 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 I'll try. Um, um, I, 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 I kind of regret in the past doing sort of talks and, and, and writing things where I was sort of very dismissive about people who kind of focus on the kind of the media approach to, to De Boer, which I think is really dumb uh, of me to have done that, um, because uh, it's obviously a massive and really, really important part of contemporary capitalist culture, and it's a bit silly to kind of be dismissive about it. I do think he's talking about something kind of deeper and, and, and broader than that, though. Um, in, in terms of his kind of visual terminology, um, yeah, I, I, it's it's... Some of it is coming from the way in which he's kind of um, reading Hegel. I mean, um, other people disagree with me on this, but I, I think a big part of it is the way in which the kind of the idea of Vorstellung uh, in, in Hegel, picture thought, becomes a representation, representation in, in French and then translated on into kind of representation in English. You've also got a sense in which the notion of spectacle in, in French is kind of show. There's maybe a dimension of kind of performance kind of going, going on there. So there are kind of registers of it that aren't kind of coming through. But, but yeah, he, he, I think he wants to say a few things at the same time. On the one hand, he wants to accommodate the sense in which this is a society that's kind of replete with kind of visual imagery. Um, he wants to kind of tie that into the kind of the story. He wants to uh, it, it sort of acknowledge the fact that, you know, post-war Europe is now kind of swamped by fads, fashions, images, and all the rest of these kind of things. But at the same time, I think he also wants to tell a more kind of complicated story about um, uh, alienation, uh, separation, kind of loss of historical agency and all the rest of it. And I think he's trying to do both things at the same time. Uh, And that's one of the reasons why he's so hard to read, really. It's it's a really, really difficult text, as I said, to the spectacle. Um, But I think the concept, I mean, one of the first theses he says, it's, it's an attempt to kind of, I forget how it goes now, but but it's about trying to kind of gather the, the historical moment under one kind of rubric. Uh, and I think this is a kind of a rubric which is supposed to gather those three dimensions of the spectacle that I used in that quotation. You've got the kind of the visual stuff, you've got the kind of the idea about the commodity, but you've also got the sense that life itself has become some kind of representation. And I'm not sure if that answers your question though. And actually, Evan has uh, followed up with a question um, asking you, you know, how does the organised left um, read or perceive De Boer today? Um, I had a conversation with, 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 with someone a, few, a, few, a little while ago who, who um, was working on, um, uh, who's doing his, doing his PhD on De Boer in the archive in Paris because they've got the De Boer archives um, over there in the, in the BNF. 
And, uh, and I, I said, you know, what, what's the kind of take on it um, over there? And he said, it, it's similar to how it is in the UK. People either kind of think this guy's a media theorist or he's helpful for talking about art, or they just don't want to touch him with a barge pole because he's so associated with the kind of the hard end of 1968. Um, how that then kind of plays out in, 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 in the stuff that happens afterwards, the kind of gilets jaunes and things like this, I'm not sure, but I know it has a big influence on, on the Invisible Committee, um, but that, that kind of crowd. Um, so so, so it, it, it's there and it feeds into, it's a big influence on Theory Communiste, um, but that kind of stuff. Um, but I'm not as good on, on the French stuff as, as I ought to be. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to go back up to the first question from Paniotis. Um, question for Jason. In Balabar, the thinking of the other scene led to the conceptualization of civility as a way to think of politics of transformation without cruelty. What would be the analog analogy in Tossel? Uh, a return to a Gramscian conception of emancipatory politics as pedagogy, perhaps? Question. Over to you, Jason. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I do think that there is a, and I, you know, compress this for the sake of the paper. Um, I think in the 90s, in the, the long passage I quote from Bally Barr was from, from 1995, from The Infinite Contradiction. Uh, Bally Barr is thinking much more in terms of these two scenes, uh, the scene of economic conflict, and the scene of sort of imaginary identification. I think later in the in the 2000s, I think the three concepts of politics comes out first in 2002. Um, he has his third dimension, this dimension of civility, which is where questions about violence and so on enter into. So there's a sort of a, a kind of third that doesn't complete some, like a dialectic that completes the two, but is is a necessary, another level of displacement. Um, and then Tosell, I think it's interesting that, that the, the, the Gramscian dimension that I think comes up most prominently in Tosell is the idea of passive revolution. And I think the thing that that, that Tosser really insists on um, in in his reading, especially his later readings of Gramsci, is very in, in line with his reading of Marx, where he he argues that you know Marx had two different criticisms of, of religion. The early Marx was religion was alienation; it was very Feuerbachian. But the the latter Marx, the Marx of commodity fetishism and of capital, is the Marx of this kind of religion of daily life, in which the very practices of commodity exchange and the wage that we enter into produce their own sort of way of imagining or, or figuring our sense of the world, um, and that that he connects to to sort of a a, a Gramscian passive revolution where he basically argues that you know sort of neoliberalism has been a massive uh, 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 sort of revolution in the sense of a rolling back of the gains made by the workers movement in the in the 20th century and increasingly sort of fragmentation and atomization of 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 collective life um so I do think that if there is and I think it's an interesting suggestion even though the the text I was referring to from Tosell is pretty late 20, 2014. So I'm not sure how much more his thinking developed from this. But if you want to think about a pedagogical, pedagogical dimension of politics, I think its primary obstacle would be not so much sort of overt ideologies um, that are disseminated and so on, but the this, this sort of religion of daily life or the way in which our fundamental practices that were engaged in sort of produce their own spontaneous ideologies of of fragmentation isolation and competition and the pedagogical dimension would have to be a way to overcome uh, uh, that uh, very entrenched way of seeing the world which is all the more uh, uh, entrenched because it stems not from discourses or, or, or what people are saying, but it just stems from the practices we engage in in a daily way. I mean, it's analogous in some sense to sort of a, a sense of the spectacle to, to sort of make that connection. Yeah, I mean, let's, uh, thank, thank you, Jason. Let's follow that up, um, kind of question for all three of you. So can we think of our contemporary culture wars uh, coming from both uh, the liberals and the conservatives as a part of the spectacle? Who'd like to go first? 
I guess I probably should. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> um, what the, okay, but more, more sort of sensibly, um, uh, one of the things I kind of sort of burbled through um, was the idea that the board's comments on the society of the spectrum might be worth revisiting. Um, and that's because I think it talks about stuff like this, or at least it anticipates it in, in, in various ways. Um, the book, um, it, 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 it's, it's like, you know, here is the world 20 years after 1968. Um, what has it turned into? And it's a pretty bleak picture. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a complicated book because he's been very cagey about the way he writes. He's got these kind of cryptic opening paragraphs where he says, I can't give too much information to just about anybody. But um, but, but the overall picture is that this is a society swamped by um, confusion, disorientation, distraction, um, with all these incredibly complicated webs of intrigue uh, and manipulation and all the rest of it. Uh, it, it, it makes comments about, um, the, the book closes with comments about the idea that we're going to start getting kind of um, uh, figures able to take advantage of this new context and, 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 and to to kind of um, use it to their advantage. I mean, th this comes via a kind of a discussion about military strategy and he's saying that, you know, you respond to the terrain, you respond to the weapons available and that's how you adapt. And we're gonna start getting people who can use this to their own advantage. So it, it, it's, it's pretty sharp in terms of kind of um, thinking about where we are at the moment in some respects. Um, and it, I don't think it'd be very difficult to think about so-called culture wars um, using some of those, uh, that, that, that material perhaps. I'll just say uh, I don't I don't know enough about uh, the board or the or the, uh, the spectacle. Um, that I, I I think that one of the things is that you get a criticism of the culture wars. That the culture wars are a distraction. The culture wars are about trying to make these kind of uh, things which aren't really kind of issues into issues to distract from the agendas of the government. So that the, the, you know the the, the war on woke by um, the Johnson government in Britain, you know, example, is using things like the National Trust being you know, anti-colonial uh, and kind of like taking Oxford, taking down the picture of the Queen in, in a common room, um, you know, that these are distractions. Um, and I, I would argue that, yeah, that they may play a function that these are being employed cynically by by politicians and by the press and by various you know political actors, but also it is it has an under underpinning ideological uh, motive is to is this talk about the Overton window, uh, shifting it to the right, shifting our, you know our perception of what is uh, acceptable politics, uh, what is also then kind of like fair game in a political sphere, um, and then also kind of like adding various issues to the political armory of the right uh, you know by politicizing certain issues is that they make it a, a wedge issue or an issue that they can then claim ownership over uh, uh, and you know the, the, i don't think you know that the often, you know, there is a depiction of culture wars as a distraction but there's a, i think there's a much kind of, kind of more uh, conscious ideological thing going on. Um, I'm not sure how that relates to the board and and then the spectacle. I'm not an expert in that kind of area, uh, but I think that yeah, the, the culture war is more than a distraction. Jason, do you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I think that the in terms of the, the the spectacle aspect or maybe the imaginary aspect, whatever language you want to use of these culture wars, two things. One is that dimension, I think, cuts both ways. It cuts in the sense of there is an aspect of, um, of some identity politics which can be used as a you know a spectacle. I mean, if you think, if you look what happened, say, in the U.S. and in the summer of 2020 after these massive Black Lives Matter uh, protests, you had all these bizarre kind of like symbolic concessions of like removing, you know, uh, uh, Aunt Jemima, the sort of brand of, of pancake syrup, removing these sort of racist images from brands and from other things that they seemed to have nothing to do with what people were in the streets about, right? The sense of like, okay, we'll change this, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll change these 
caricatures or cartoons or whatever the case may be. So there's that distraction. But I think there's a distraction on the other side too. There is a kind of weird figure of a kind of of a kind of imaginary of class that is a kind of idea of the working class that is not distracted by race, gender, et cetera, which is a bizarre claim to make because, because is the working class not itself made up of people of all different sorts of races and made up of men and women equally? It ends up being the strange assertion of a working class that can only be understood as a white male working, working class. And that, that figure of a kind of like pure politics of class that would not address anything to do with race, gender, et cetera, is itself its own kind of counter distraction. And I, and I think that, um, so that's the first thing I want to say. And then the second thing is, I do think there is, um, with all of these, you know, the, the task I think is to find the real moment of conflict and power beneath the distractions, like to go back to, to the example I just gave you, to insist that the issue was not, you know, to insist after the big uh, Black Lives Matter protests of last summer, to insist that, that um, the issue is not representation in cartoons or brand logos or these sorts of things, to insist that the issue had to do with the policing and killing of bodies in different types of spaces to constantly, um, excavate the, the, the material relations that cannot be distracted away in these issues of spectacle or, or representation. Great, thank you. Uh, I like that, um, that idea of uh, the material relations that cannot be distracted away. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, Tom or Evan, if you wanted to come back on, on that, we don't have any other questions coming in the chat at the moment. And this might be the last chance for people watching to put a question in. Um, if you've got one, put it in now, I would suggest. Uh, Tom Tom and Evan, do you want to come back on, on Jason's? I'm not sure I've got anything to add. I, I think Jason put it very well. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll just, uh, just the, yes, the, there's this kind of idealised working class uh, that you know that um, is devo is devoid of these other um, you know race, uh, sex, gender uh, dimensions, um, which kind of like it, you know it comes up in uh, the RCP and in and in Spiked is that you know that there's an argument that the the elites are the ones concerned with these issues and that the, the working class is, is only interested in kind of economics and so forth like that. So, you know, the, one of the, the ironies is that the working class, you know, in the 1990s, you know, the working class and the, and the working class politics is seen as like dead, you know, that socialism is, is unviable, um, you know, the midnight in the century article kind of really kind of like, you know, the working class doesn't have anywhere to go. Um, but the working class is often invoked in, in, in spite uh, as something to play out as in opposition to the, the elites to capitalism and the state, you know, that, you know, that the work, the, the working class just wants to get on with improving their lives. And it is the elites who are putting this kind of woke identity politics, are uh, thrusting it upon them. Um, so, you know, that, uh, yeah, the idealised working, working class is used uh, by Spike and, and other people in the, in the culture wars as kind of like a way to attack anti-racist politics and kind of like, uh, you know, anti-sexist politics and so forth like that. Um, so, so yeah, so the, that, that's, yeah, so that idealised working class is something which um, is used, you know, by, by various actors in the culture war and you can definitely see this in, in uh, Spike. So, ha given that this idealization of the working class has been very efficaciously uh, appropriated by uh, conservatism, how does the left, in its thinking, in its philosophizing, in its practice, differentiate itself from uh, the kind of the 
Is he gonna go? Okay, it's paused. I think I, th I think we lost Michael. Okay. Yeah. I, so, sometimes people come back after this, but he won't. He won't know maybe that we haven't heard him for the how long he's been talking. So. Um, In answer to his question, I don't know. I don't know what. I don't know what can be done. And I, I don't. <laughs> I don't know a political strategy. He's really gone. Sure. Should we wind up? Should we say last words or just leave it there? <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm happy to leave, leave it there. I, I, I don't have any yeah. great <laughs> words of wisdom to depart. I mean, I'll say something about the the question where it was. I saw it going. I mean, I do think that I think I think this is part of the issue of the of the left in general is is that um, or a certain idea of of, of Marxist left is is that um, you know for Marx, I think. Um, the working class is not so much, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not so much a constituency, a set of behaviors or ideals. It's a, it's a condition defined by one's relation to the, to the means of production. And in some sense, it, in, in that way, it, it defies a certain kind of picture thinking to use that sense in the sense that you can't just sum it up with an image of a hard hat or whatever as an identity, because it, it encompasses so many different ways of being exploited so many different forms of wage labor. And I think that one of the challenges of a kind of uh, kind of Marxist left is to is to push beyond the, the up image of a hard hat or whatever as an identity. Because it, it... Okay, that hearing myself was disturbing. But anyways, uh, uh, and to push beyond the representation of it and and to the actual condition, which exceeds, I think, any attempt to pinpoint it with a figure or an image or so on. And I think that's a problem of, of, of the truly universalist sort of left communist politics is that you're always pushing beyond figurations of uh, groups and trying to actually um, address the structural conditions which don't lend themselves to an easy image or identification in the same way. Okay, thank you, Jason. I'm not, <laughs> not complete, uh, my computer just turned off, so I was terminated. Okay. With extreme prejudice and mid centers but I kind of caught some of what what you were, were saying. Um, but I, I don't know. Did did the other did Tom and Evan uh, manage to speak? Uh, I, I think I think I've I've, I've said enough. Thank, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. Um, in that case, I think what we'll do is we will we'll wrap it up here. Thank you to the three speakers. Um, <laughs> for your contributions and thank you for everyone watching and for the questions. Thank you. Cheers.